make hospitality your special care, says St. Paul in the reading chosen for St. Bridget, the saint of hospitality by excellence. We are told of stories linked with that giving, 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 with miraculous powers of giving, because God was never outdone in generosity. This hidden saint became extremely popular. The monastery grew and grew in Kildare. She worked in conjunction with St. Conleth and the faith took root in that area. There is no smoke without fire and if in other countries, Wales, where it's called Santa's Fried, Brittany, even Flanders and Portugal, Alsace, we find her name in dedications it means that her cult was early and extremely popular. It would also mean that probably wherever she was invoked, her power of intercession became evident. So she was a great saint who came out of obscurity. And it is possibly to her that St. Patrick is referring when he talks in his confessions about this. Among others, a blessed Irish woman of noble birth, beautiful, full grown, whom I had baptised, came to us after some days for a particular reason. She told us that she had received a message from a messenger of God. By the way, Baleach in Hebrew means a messenger and it therefore has that meaning in also English, angel, angelos, the one who announces in Greek. And he had admonished her to be a virgin of Christ and draw near to God. Now that is to be picked up, as I'll mention in a minute. Thanks be to God, on the sixth day, after this, she most laudably and eagerly chose what all virgins of Christ do. Not that their fathers agree with them, no. They often even suffer persecution and undeserved reproaches from their parents, and yet their number is ever increasing. This phenomenon goes back to the earliest times. We have evidence that already at Antioch, those who were undertaking along with the duties of Christian baptism, the extra bit of chosen virginity for the kingdom of heaven, were the first to be baptized of those catechumens of the Easter ceremony indicating that from those early times it was a grace to be treasured. And we have evidence of that as early as St. Paul himself, when he writes to the Corinthians in his first epistle, chapter 7. And so when it came to the island, we see that this led also to a pattern of Christian life, specifically Irish and Celtic. We find it likewise in Wales and in Scotland, which is closely linked with Ireland in the initial stages of evangelization. It is that it is a monastic church, with the abbot, and in this case the abbess, becoming very important. That, perhaps, we need to recuperate not necessarily in its formal structure, but in its dynamic. All must start from contemplation and praise of God. 
we do not program the Holy Ghost. He programs us. And those initiatives that he gives because he wants them, and because they're picked up in the right place, prayer, are the ones that he wants to engage in. The faith took off, therefore, without bloodshed, and this became the island of saints and scholars, very faithful to that grace. Great penance, as we see in those beehive cells on Skelly Michael in the Atlantic Ocean. It was very difficult to get out there hours and hours of rowing and dangerous. So they were alone, depending on providence, available unto him. People loved places of seclusion. They are places that favour encounter with the silent one. We drive him away from our life often, even in his service, by having to know all things and not wanting to learn actually what would be more beneficial to our soul if we simplified our interior life. A word from scripture in that atmosphere would teach us more than all about what is just going on yesterday in such and such a place in church life. And so it is that this was a thorn in the flesh to England. Our Lady's dowry, a loss which became a prey to incomplete theology and sacramental life, essentially because of one man's problem, Henry VIII. And so what happened in England spilled over to Ireland. It would be well on this day of St. Bridget, who by the way is buried under the altar of the Anglican Cathedral in Downpatrick, called Downpatrick, not just Down, because St. Patrick ended up there. She is there with St. Columkill and Patrick himself, and a little slab just outside with simple ancient writing across and Patrick. So, it would be well on this her day to remember these generations of faith because Ireland stood out against the forces of dark in the dark ages. These monastic scribes kept learning alive and the faith and re-evangelized a darkened Europe. But then when it came to the Reformation, England wanted it to follow suit and tried all in its means to make it do that. We find it again also in the famine, and people were not willing to sell their soul for the soup. They kept the faith and died. Our Lady consoled them and accepted their sacrifice when quietly she prayed with them visibly at knock. Our blessed, late, our blessed Lady was there with St. Joseph quietly and with St. John the Evangelist. And we have also the fact that it is a Eucharistic miracle, that the Lamb is the centre of it on the throne, which is the altar. But this we need to remember, that there was torture and martyrdom, exiled by the thousand to the Barbados, they would not give that precious jewel which they had, the holy sacrifice of the mass. The rosary said in the family kept the faith going. The faith was handed on. The mass rocks, we must not forget them. We're back to that now actually, under lockdown in a sense. But this morning I was given this by a friend of mine. It had a story behind it. It was written by a Jesuit and it fell into 
oblivion. Some years ago, in function of his work, collecting bits here and there, he found in a garbage can this thrown away volume. And he who hardly read a book opened it and couldn't put it down. This must be known, he said to himself. He hadn't a suit to do it with, but Providence provided, and he got it published, and it has been republished, and it is worth being aware of, because Providence wanted it to be known again. It was a miracle of Providence that it came out into the open. And so, should anyone be interested, lest we forget, it would be well to know that this little volume contains all the gory details of what about 264 Irish martyrs suffered lest we lose the sacramental life. And in their midst are bishops. Bishops. It is well to remember the holy bishops who knew what it meant to keep the treasure of the faith available and intact. The faith was kept in secret, and celebrations happened there in quiet little cottages hidden away. The faith was there, the celebrations were simple, but I am sure that they were very intense. But then we must remember also the torture. I have here before me an engraving of something which had happened. It was the roasting of the feet of a holy bishop, Dermot O'Hurley, Archbishop of Cashel, martyred in 1584. Just as an example, a representation of what pain to the utmost meant lest we forget. Those feet sticking out of the stocks were covered in butter and oil so that they could roast and the fire was applied from underneath and roast they did with all the odour of roasting meat until in the end there was but bone. This was a bishop who knew what it meant to keep the faith intact and make the sacraments available to the people of God, starving materially and spiritually. Should anyone be interested, the book is easily available. It's only about 10 euro, I believe, and can be got easily from the aid to the church in need, Ireland, and any proceeds go towards the aid to the church in need. I make you aware of it in case anyone wants to know more about what went before us and what we take for granted. There is also a number, if anyone wants to order it by phone, It's Dublin, which is 01 I found actually that coming into contact with pain on the page, my faith was reignited. It might do the same for others, lest we forget. Salvio dulce